This is a 33 kilovolt substation, often jokingly blamed for nighttime power cuts, but there's much more to it than that. In reality, this substation receives power for higher voltage stations. For instance, a 132 kV substation feeds into this one. Above that, we have a 220 kV and 440 kV substations, forming a voltage hierarchy in the transmission network. There's also a 765 kV level above 440 kV. But for this video, we'll focus on the 400 kV tier, and you'll soon see why that matters. We often hear about electricity traveling from power stations to our homes. But if our appliances need only 440 volts, why do we use massive 440 kV lines carrying nearly 4 lakh volts? Let's break this down with a real-world example. Picture a city, say Kota, where a large super thermal power plant burns coal to generate electricity. It has 9 generator units producing around 1,240 megawatts of power in total. For simplicity in the visuals, we've shown just one generator. Once electricity is generated, it must be transmitted over long distances. The first step is to send the generator's output through a step-up transformer, which boosts the voltage from around 11 to 15 kV up to around 440 kV, making it suitable for high-voltage transmission. The output from the step-up transformer is fed into a switchyard, which we'll explain in detail later. In simple terms, its job is to divide power into multiple outgoing feeders. As shown, several transmission towers branch out from here, each carrying electricity to different regions. Now imagine a 440 kV transmission line carrying electricity from Kota to Jaipur, a distance of nearly 250 kilometers. If we transmitted electricity at just 11,000 volts, the typical generator output over such a long distance a major power loss would occur. By the time it reached Jaipur, the voltage would drop to around 7,000 to 8,000 volts. Here's an important point. Suppose the generator produces around 1,240 megawatts. That's the amount of electricity in watts, which you can see on your screen. Dividing this by 1,000 gives us the number of electrical units generated. Every electricity company aims to deliver these units to consumers with minimal loss so they can bill consumers accurately for the energy used. Now imagine that only 1 lakh units reach Jaipur. That means 24,000 units were lost during transmission. A direct financial loss for the power company, as consumers only pay for what appears on their household meters. To avoid such losses, the voltage is increased during transmission. Technically, power equals voltage multiplied by current. The total power stays constant, but transformers adjust the voltage and current to optimize transmission. When voltage rises, current automatically decreases. Higher current heats up transmission conductors, turning electrical energy into heat, leading to power loss along the way. By stepping up the voltage, transformers reduce the current, which keep conductor temperatures low. Here's the key. Lower current allows for thinner conductors, reducing the cost of transmission infrastructure. When the 400 kV line reaches a city like Jaipur, the next phase begins, gradually stepping down the voltage, managed by the receiving switchyard. In this switchyard, imagine there are three incoming lines, two from Kota and one from Delhi. If the Kota side plant fails or demand suddenly spikes, the system can use the Delhi line as a backup. These high voltage lines terminate at a structure called a gantry tower. The first equipment they connect to in the switchyard is a lightning arrester, installed in parallel with the line. During thunderstorms, lightning often splits into multiple branches as it nears the ground. These branches naturally target the tallest objects, usually trees, buildings, or transmission lines. As transmission lines are installed at great heights, they're highly prone to lightning strikes. A line carrying 4 lakh volts can suddenly face a surge of 1 to 5 million volts far beyond the insulation and design limits of substation equipment. These dangerous spikes must be safely discharged to the ground through lightning arresters. The lightning arrester handles this by diverting excess voltage into the ground via a low-resistance path. As electricity follows the easiest route, the surge bypasses the main system and safely flows to Earth. A metallic grounding grid is installed beneath the switchyard. 
Its role is to absorb and safely dissipate these sudden electrical surges into the soil, protecting the equipment. Apart from lightning, a lightning arrestor also protects against internal voltage surges within the line. Any sudden spike is immediately grounded to prevent damage to the equipment. After the lightning arrestor, the next device in the list is the Capacitive Voltage Transformer, or the CVT, which performs two key functions. Think about it. How can you measure a voltage as high as 4 lakh volts? Standard meters can't handle such high levels. This is where the CVT comes in. Instead of working like a typical power transformer, it uses a capacitive voltage divider with an auxiliary transformer to proportionally reduce the voltage. The reduced signal, usually around 110 volts, can then be safely read by protection relays and metering systems for monitoring and control. The CVT's second function is better understood through a device called a wave trap. Transmission lines don't just carry power, they also carry communication signals between substations, which is essential for coordinated grid operations. Here's an important point. Mobile phones use communication frequencies in the megahertz range for fast and clear audio. In contrast, transmission lines operate at much lower frequencies. Power transmission lines typically use frequencies between 30 kHz and 500 kHz, so that communication speed is much slower compared to mobile networks. The CVT plays a key role in this communication process. It helps inject and receive signals within the transmission line. These signals are high frequency, while household electricity operates at just 50 Hz. To ensure that only 50 Hz power reaches consumers, a device called a wave trap is installed in series with the line. It blocks all high frequency communication signals, allowing only standard 50 Hz power to pass through. From here, electrical power flows towards a current transformer. This device measures the current in the line. If a fault occurs and current suddenly rises, the current transformer or CT detects and reports the spike. We'll explain the working of a current transformer in a future video. But in short, a CT steps down the high current to a safe standard level, usually 1 or 5 amperes, depending on the system. This lets relays and meters measure large currents without direct contact with high voltage circuits. From here, we begin exploring the structure of a complex switchyard. It may seem complicated at first, but the equipment and layout generally follow a standard pattern with only slight variations from place to place. This 440 kV substation contains three main bus bars, main bus 1, main bus 2, and a transfer bus. We'll look at their specific roles shortly, but the core objective is to energize these buses. After passing through the current transformer, the line loops back near the gantry tower and descends. The first device it connects to is an isolator. An isolator functions much like a household switch. However, unlike a domestic switch, it cannot break a live high-voltage line. In fact, an isolator can only disconnect a line when it's already de-energized. Think of it like switching off your home light switch. You do it after the light is already off. The isolator works the same way at high voltages. You might ask, why not use the isolator to disconnect a live line? It's a valid question. And the answer lies in how high-voltage systems operate. If an isolator is open while the line is live, high voltage creates a strong arc between its contacts. Even after they separate, the current jumps across the air gap as a dangerous spark. This intense arcing can overheat and damage the contacts, making the isolator unsafe and unreliable. That's why an isolator should never be used to break a live circuit. So how do we disconnect it safely? Let's find out. Just after the isolator, there's another current transformer, similar to the one we saw earlier. It detects fault-level currents when abnormalities occur in the system. Next is the circuit breaker, similar to the MCB switch in household fuse boxes. It automatically trips and disconnects the line when a fault or overcurrent is detected. After the circuit breaker, an other isolator is placed. From there, the supply flows to main bus 1, which becomes energized and ready to distribute power further. Let's take a fault scenario to understand how the system works. Imagine a line from the switchyard extending outwards, and a conductor falls to the ground, creating a serious line-to-ground fault. The current transformer instantly detects the surge in current, 
signaling a fault. It sends a command to the circuit breaker which trips and cuts off power beyond that point to prevent further damage. Although the circuit breaker disconnects the line, there's one more challenge. This breaker is an SF6, sulfur hexafluoride type, and when it trips, it contacts physically separate. Like an isolator, sparking can occur here too. But SF6 breakers are filled with SF6 gas, which acts as an arc extinguisher, quickly quenching the spark between separating contacts. The only issue is that after tripping, the gap between the contacts remains quite small, allowing a small amount of leakage current to flow across. To put it simply, a circuit breaker is like a couple after a breakup. They've stopped talking, but there's still a slight connection lingering. To ensure complete isolation, the isolator is opened as well. Unlike the circuit breaker, it creates a wide physical gap between contacts, cutting off any remaining connection. Think of it as the final breakup, clean and complete. You may now ask, why is there an isolator placed before the circuit breaker? The answer lies in maintenance safety. Circuit breakers are complex electromechanical devices and often need servicing. To allow technicians to work safely, an isolator is provided to fully disconnect the supply on both sides. In the same way, all three incoming lines energize main bus 1 using the same configuration. To energize main bus 2, the same equipment sequence is followed. Isolator, current transformer, circuit breaker, isolator, exactly like main bus 1. A third bus bar is also installed in the substation, called the transfer bus. A line from the gantry tower is brought down and connected to it through an isolator. One important point, all three bus bars are not energized at the same time. Currently only main bus 1 is live. Its isolator is closed, while those for main bus 2 and the transfer bus remain open. From main bus 1, the line flows towards the load side, passing through an isolator, a circuit breaker, another isolator, and then rising up through the gantry tower to reach a transformer. This is a step-down transformer that reduces the voltage from 440 kV to 220 kV. A second transformer is installed nearby and connected in the same way. Just as the main bus supplies power in one direction, it can also send power the other way, where more step-down transformers can be connected if needed. Interestingly, there's a device here that looks like a transformer, but has no output terminals. If you've got an electrical engineering background, drop a comment if you know what it is. We'll explain it in a future video. Let me explain a simple example to help you better visualize how this setup works in the real world. Imagine this transformer supplies electricity to an area where government officials live in a city like Jaipur, while the other transformer powers a residential area like Mansarovar Colony. Now suppose the supply from Kota is interrupted due to a fault, and the power coming from Delhi isn't enough to support both the government zone and Mansarovar colony at once. In that case, the residential area is disconnected first, while the government zone continues receiving uninterrupted electricity as a priority. While people often blame electricity providers for such cutoffs, in reality they follow predefined load shedding protocols. These decide which areas must be prioritized during shortages. Now let's look deeper into the multiple bus bar system to see how it ensures reliability and flexibility in such situations. Take the example of a line from Coda feeding into main bus 1. Now suppose a component collected to main bus 1 develops a fault or needs scheduled maintenance. In such cases, the isolators and circuit breakers of main bus 1 are opened, and the load is shifted to main bus 2 to maintain uninterrupted power flow. On the load side of main bus 2, the supply flows through an isolator, circuit breaker, isolator sequence, then rises through the gantry tower to energize the connected transformer. This setup ensures the substation keeps running, even during maintenance, by transferring the load from one bus bar to another, maintaining supply reliability. Now let's talk about the transfer bus. Unlike the main buses, it doesn't have protection devices like CTs or circuit breakers. It's connected only through a single isolator. The transfer bus is used only as a temporary backup. During rare cases, when both main bus 1 and main bus 2 are offline due to false or maintenance. One key role of a switchyard is load balancing. During festival seasons, electricity demand rises sharply due to heavy usage in homes, markets, and public areas. 
In such situations, all incoming lines, for example from Kota and Delhi, are distributed between Main Bus 1 and Main Bus 2. Once both bus bars are energized, some transformers are linked to the Kota side supply, while others are connected to the Delhi side, helping balance the overall load. Although both bus bars run independently with their own isolators, CTs and circuit breakers, a special device called a bus coupler is installed between them. It includes its own isolator, CT and circuit breaker, just like any regular feeder. The bus coupler connects main bus 1 and main bus 2 during specific situations, like load transfer, maintenance, or fault isolation. By linking the two temporarily, it enables flexible load sharing, redundancy, and uninterrupted power flow inside the substation. The transformer shown here is a step-down unit that reduces the voltage from 400 kV to 220 kV, even after stepping down from 440 kV to 220 kV. It's still a very high voltage. It's typically used in areas with high electricity demand. For instance, imagine this 220 kV substation is located in Jaipur's government zone. While another transformer in the same setup supplies electricity to Mansarovar colony, a typical residential area. Similarly, multiple 220 kV feeders are sent to other key areas, like regional zones or smaller urban centers. A single substation can dispatch several feeders, each supplying a different populated area. Operationally, the 220 kV substation works much like the 440 kV substation we discussed earlier. As electricity leaves the 220kV substation, it passes through another step-down transformer that reduces the voltage to 132kV. From there, the switchyard sends out multiple feeders, supplying electricity to smaller towns and residential colonies. Next comes the 132kV substation, which again steps the voltage down, this time to 33kV. This substation also dispatches multiple outgoing feeders to different destinations. For instance, if an industrial area has high power demand, a 33 kV feeder is routed directly to it. At the industrial site, a step-down transformer reduces the voltage from 33 kV to 440 volts, suitable for operating equipment and machinery. Another feeder may be routed to a village or rural area. In such cases, a separate 33 kV substation is built locally. This rural substation steps the voltage down from 33 kV to 11 kV, preparing it for final distribution within the village. From the 11 kV substation, multiple outgoing feeders are routed to different parts of the village or rural area. At each of these points, usually near streets or neighborhoods, a local transformer steps the voltage down from 11 kV to 440 volts, which is the standard supply level for homes. So ultimately, we are the final consumers of electricity. I hope you've clearly understood the complete journey of electricity from generation to your home. If you still have any questions or doubts, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And don't forget to visit the channel for more engaging and educational videos. Subscribe for content that makes science and engineering easy to understand. Thank you.